Greetings, everyone, and welcome to God Save the King. I am your host, Tim Kyes. I want to thank you for joining me on the Truth Be Told Radio Network, where you can hear my show every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And as my manner is, we got a great show for you today. I'm very excited about tonight's show because we are going to go back and actually talk about God Save the King. I mean, I talk about a lot of things, but God Save the King is primarily about the nativity. So if you haven't heard my show before, if or if you've been hearing it for the past few weeks where we've been talking about other subjects, we're going back to the nativity tonight. We're going to share some information that is inferred in some of my earlier shows and then some of my earlier sharings, lectures, teachings, whatever it is you want to call them. But I don't really get specific about it. And today I took the time to look some of this stuff up uh, in my show prep. And, you know, we're going to actually, you know, look at some of that stuff. But before we get into that, let's take, you know, just one minute here. Let's cover a little bit of business that we always like to do when you are talking about, you know, social media. Here it is. If you enjoy the Truth Be Told Radio Network and you enjoy it in a video format, our preferred platform is Rumble. So you can always go to https colon forward slash forward slash rumble.com forward slash C forward slash TBTRN and watch video. You can watch the Truth Be Told Radio Network, not only my show, but all of the great shows that are on the Truth Be Told Radio Network. Now, if you prefer more of a podcast format, then obviously here it is. There's the address on the screen. Once again, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.truthbetoldnetwork.org forward slash podcast. Or in other words, simply go to the Truth Be Told Radio Network website and click on the podcast tab. There's tab up there that'll say podcast. Click on that. That will take you to a page where you will see the icons for the 12 major podcast platforms where you can find the Truth Be Told Radio Network and then simply go to the platform of your choice, select it. It will take you to their website and then you can enroll or you know subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you choose. And then finally, and this is funny because I was doing my show prep and I was, you know, because I mean, come on, this is, you know, this is radio, uh, it's video, and you know, you practice, you practice saying your lines, right? So let's see, let's see if it happens again. This is pretty funny, uh, because if you prefer more of a radio format, then simply go to the Truth Be Told Radio Network website. Once again, https forward slash forward slash www.truthbetoldnetwork.org. And then you can click on the big listen live button. But what you can also do is that if you have any kind of smart device, including your phone, you can simply say, Hey Siri, hey Google, hey Alexa, whichever. See there, my, my phone just lit up. My phone's sitting here next to me. And I said, Hey Siri. And um, it's it's firing up. So this is pretty funny. What happened to me just a little while ago? I was practicing my lines, and I said, "Hey Siri, play Truth Be Told Radio Network." And uh, it's not going to do it this time. Oh, no worries. But yeah, it, you know, the phone just reacted and uh, you know started to play the Truth Be Told Radio Network off of my phone. So there you go. Any kind of smart device. So whether it's actually your phone or like I said, if you've got a Google or Amazon, you know, uh, home device, right? You can simply click on that and uh, listen to the Truth Be Told Network that way. So that's, that's very, very cool. Very good way to do that. So like I said, we're gonna talk about the nativity again today. OK, we haven't talked about the nativity in a minute, and I think it's just time to go back there. I was actually having a really fun conversation with a friend of mine on the phone last night, and I happened to mention the fact that there's this very interesting little paradigm that exists for the first couple hundred of years after Christ. And it's both good and bad. What I was illustrating during the phone call last night is that the early church, the first century, second century, and certainly by the time you get to the third and fourth centuries, it was not as clean cut as we would like it to be. So there, there it is. Now that's a friend of mine trying to call me. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Dave. I won't be able to answer your phone right. Answer the phone right now. Got to do my show here. 
Um, so what I was saying was I was illustrating to my friend the fact that the first couple of hundred years after Christ were not as clean cut as we like to think. There's a lot of Christians of various denominations, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Independent. There's a lot of Christians that we frankly believe a kind of fairy tale about the early church and tend to believe that it was all peace, love, and unicorns and stuff like that, and that the early church didn't have issues. And I'm telling you, the early church had a lot of issues. I mean, we see it in Scripture, okay? So we that means we know that the issues set in right of way. I mean, you, you don't write away, not right of way, write away. You know, all you don't have to get any further in than Acts chapter six, where we read about how it was either Hellenic believers, okay, or Hellenized Jews that the widows were not being taken care of. We see that complaint in Acts chapter six, right? And then we see the response of the apostles to this complaint in setting up deacons and stuff like that. And the book of Acts, boy, I could go, and we will sometime, I guess, really go off on a tangent talking about the book of Acts because there's a lot of things in the book of Acts that you see the early church make an effort to do. And that's what we have, that's what we have in Acts chapter six is you see them make an effort to do this thing and then you never see it again which is really interesting. But my point being is that the early church was not as clean and tidy as we would like it to be. It was not necessarily one big happy family because right there in Acts chapter six, the apostles say, well, we're going to devote ourselves to doctrine and prayer. And then you guys, we're going to select some other people to go actually do the work. Ooh, Interesting. So there, there you have it, the beginnings of the clergy laity divide, which frankly isn't really supposed to be there. There really isn't a clergy laity divide. It's the body of Christ. We all have um, functions in the body of Christ, but not offices. That is a concept that is actually foreign to the New Testament. The idea that there is an office that is authoritative and that therefore, oh yeah, the uh, the apostles and the prophets, you know, they go off and they do, you know, the the official stuff, the authority stuff, and then everybody else goes off and does the actual work. Um, so you got to be very, very, very careful with that. So, at any rate, if you've ever seen my television show, what you can do is you can go to my website. Here, let me do this real quick. Check this out. Actually, I guess it's on the scroll, too. I forgot about that. Right there. Yep, see, right, right there. Right there, the scroll. Going across the bottom, you can see my website. And if you go to my website, you can find a tab that says GSK TV. I made a television show about six years ago. Me and a good friend of mine, me and a bunch of good friends of mine made a television show. And one of the things I talk about is the fact that there really isn't any documentary evidence regarding the birth date of Christ until the early third century. So let me show this to you. Let me uh, click on the old screen share here. We find the right button. Let's move this, move this. All right, so screen share, we'll get over here. Do, 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 do. And we want this one right now. So here we go. This is this is actual this is a graphic that is actually a holdover from my show back about 6 years ago. This is written by a man named Hippolytus or Hippolytus. It's pronounced a couple of different ways. I don't know which one is technically accurate. Hippolytus of Rome, he wrote this in the early 3rd century, so right around 210 AD or 210 CE is when he wrote this and this is the first reference to the birth of Christ that actually has any significant detail. Now, there are others, and that's actually what we're going to talk about today, but they're vague. 
This is the first one that has any reasonable detail whatsoever. So it reads, For the first advent of our Lord in the flesh, when he was born in Bethlehem, eight days before the calends of January, the fourth day of the week, while Augustus was in his 42nd year. And that comes from Hippolytus, his commentary on the book of Daniel. Okay, so that's the first ever like reference to a specific reference to the birth date of Jesus Christ. Now, it's problematic. That statement is problematic, and we're going to come back to it. But what I want to do is I want to fill in the blanks because that's, like I said, that's early first, early, pardon me, early third century AD, 210 ish, right? So that's two, roughly 200 years after Jesus walked the earth. So how come it took that long for anybody to talk about his birthday, his birth date, right? And frankly, it's because apparently no one was really talking about it. Nobody really cared, right? So I'm going to go through a list here of some early New Testament documents, most of which you have probably never heard of, okay? Now, that's okay. It doesn't really matter. This is this is just to cover some ground here to tell you about what we know and what we don't know from what are called the apostolic fathers. So the apostolic fathers are technically the first generation, but sometimes we consider it the first and the second generation of disciples after the 12, right? So you have, and plus Paul, obviously. So you have the original evangels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you have Paul writing the predominance of the New Testament. And But that's all done, you know, no later than the first century AD. John may have written Revelation very late, maybe in the 90s AD, but by the time John writes Revelation, you know, that's pretty much it. All of the what are now considered to be the canonical writings are pretty much wrapped up. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other writings. And of course, this is a huge debate that is, you know, it's all over the place. You can find dozens, hundreds, thousands of YouTube videos and articles all over the internet about the canon of scripture and what was good about it, what was bad about it. You know, um, lots of people blaming Constantine for what was what went wrong and a lot of, you know, just all kinds of conspiracy theories about, about the canon of scripture. But there are documents that started being written right away, right away. Okay. And that therefore some of these were considered canonical for a while. And then later on when the canon was finally decided, they were rejected and not included in the canon. So this is, this is very, very interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a list of one, two, three, four, five early documents. Then we're going to move on to a few others. But I want to point something out to you because I'm about to mention five documents in particular that are non-canonical. They're, they are not in the canon of the Bible, but they are early church documents. The first one, the Didache, okay, or Didache, Didache it's in Greek, it's probably Didache, hard K, Didache, 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 um, was one of the earliest, if not the earliest Christian treatise. It was possibly written in the late first century. So it's possible that it was written in the 90s AD. Certainly it was written in the early second century if it was not. And it's anonymous. We do not know who wrote it. But this is a group of early Christian writings that speak a lot about how to do church, frankly. Um, what are the basics that we need to teach predominantly Gentile Christians as the word of God began to spread from Judea and then to Samaria and then all Israel and then Syria and then, you know, quote unquote, the uttermost parts of the earth. And it started including Gentiles. The Didache was spoke significantly about, okay, what is it that we need to teach Christians about this new subset of Judaism? Okay. It wasn't called Christianity yet. That took a minute for it to be called Christianity. It was just called the way 
you know, followers of the way, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ. And it was largely considered to be an offshoot of Judaism. It wasn't a new religion. And that's not what Jesus, frankly, ever intended was it for, was for it to be a new religion. But this is one of the earliest documents is the, the, the Didache. Okay. Then another uh, document I'm going to mention are the uh, first and second Clement. Now, this is Clement of Rome, and there's two of them, two epistles, number one and number two. So they're referred to as first and second Clement. It is, and there's all kinds of, for lack of a better word, debate or controversy surrounding all of these. First Clement is generally recognized as actually being read, by, uh, pardon me, written by Clement. Second Clement, not so much. There's a lot more discussion and debate about Second Clement, whether he actually wrote it or not. But once again, this potentially, First Clement was potentially written as early as 90-ish AD. And if not 90-ish, then certainly by the early second century, he was writing his first epistle, right? So the Didache, now first and second Clement. Then we get to the Epistle of Barnabas. I have selected these because these are just, these are the earliest and the most famous and frankly, the most reputable because there are others that aren't really all that reputable. And, you know, we just don't really need to waste our time with them. These are the ones that are considered the most reputable. Then you have the Epistle of Barnabas also considered non-canonical. All of these are non-canonical. Then you have the Shepherd of Hermas. So the Shepherd of Hermas was late second century. So second half of the second century, right? And then finally, you have the Epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. Now, I deliberately mentioned that one last because we are going to come back to that one. But my point being here is that all five or six of these documents, depending on how you count them, they are considered non-canonical. But the reason we're bringing them up is because these are the earliest Christian documents there are, okay? Because people were writing stuff down. People are coming to the faith. They're becoming followers of Christ. They're, they are disciples of the earlier apostles. And of course, they're writing letters to family and they're writing stuff down for their own benefit and things like that. So th this is how these documents came about. They, they just wrote stuff down. They needed to know. They wanted to write stuff down. But the reason I bring this up is because in every one of these documents, there is essentially no reference to the birth of Christ whatsoever. There's a couple of references to the birth, and absolutely no reference to the date other than maybe the year. Maybe the year, but nothing about the month or anything like that. So here you have five or six of the earliest Christian documents written in the first two centuries AD, and they don't say anything about the birth of Christ. The Didache, first and second Clement, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, and the Epistle of Polycarp of the Philippians, which I said we'll come back to. We're, we'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But here are five or six of the earliest documents, and there is no reference whatsoever to the birth of Christ. That's it. Now, what's interesting about this is that because there's literally no reference, you know, the question that we have to start asking is, did they even know? Were, were they even aware? Because see, the assumption, and this is what I'm going to show you um, in today's sharing, on today's show, this is part of what I'm going to show you is the assumption is as well, you know, did, didn't Jesus tell somebody, you know, wouldn't Jesus or Mary have told somebody when he was born? But then again, you can flip that over. You can make good, a good argument for saying maybe he didn't, maybe he deliberately didn't tell anybody. I mean, it's, it's a, in a way, it's a similar argument. Look at the fact that we have no, complete originals of any document. Okay. Now, once again, the skeptics and the critics and the, 
you know, the atheists, they want to make a mountain out of a molehill there and say, oh, well, we don't have any, uh, you know, we don't have any originals, so we don't know what really was said because, you know, error could creep in right away and, you know, we can't trust, you know, that's not true. That's not true at all. We have extant copies and we don't just have hundreds of extant copies. We have thousands of extant copies and they cross reference each other extremely well. So we have very good textual, um, what's the word I want to use? Transmission as it moves forward from when the originals were written and then they were lost, but they were copied. And as the text gets transmitted moving forward, we have very good textual transmission when it comes to the Bible. Not so much with other ancient documents. And I talk about this in other shows, that if you want to look at Homer's Iliad or you want to look at Julius Caesar's commentaries on the Wars of Gaul, those are considered documents with good textual transmission as well, but they don't even hold, cast a shadow on the New Testament. There's just, there's no comparison. They have, what is it, um, Homer's Iliad, I forget the number of copies, but it's not high. I don't think it's more than like maybe 100, 120, and even that might be too many, but I think that's right. I, I could be wrong. It might be five or 600. I just don't have that um, number in front of me, but that's one, of, that's one of the best ones, whereas like Julius Caesar's commentaries on the Wars of Gaul, that's got like 10 extant copies, none written any closer to the actual date than several hundred years. Almost a millennia later is when we have the earliest extant copy of that book. But the Bible is an entirely different story. We have thousands of copies coming very quickly after the original evangels were, you know, not in the game anymore. So my point, once again, however, is that these are the Didache, first and second Clement, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, and the Epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. These are some of the earliest documents, and yet they do not mention the birth date of Christ. So my point is, is that, okay, there's just no information about when he was born. So when that information does finally start to pop up, the question becomes, okay, well, how reliable is it? Because the assumption, like I started to introduce, the assumption is, is, well, didn't Jesus tell somebody? And then didn't he tell somebody? So the illustration I was going to make is that if we actually had any originals, we would be going berserk about the document. And, and therefore, there would be so much attention placed on the document that we would probably miss the message of the document, because we're paying so much attention to the document. So in a way, it might be a very good thing that we don't have any of the originals, because therefore we can pay attention to the message instead of paying attention to the document. See, And that might be very similar when it comes to the birth of Christ, is that because no one, because we don't know for absolute certain, right? Now, I'm, I'm very convinced of my theory. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, I have to say, we don't know for sure. We don't. We don't know for sure. Now, I believe the preponderance of the evidence points to September 11th, 3 BC. But if you want to talk about, you know, scientific proof or proof in it, not, not proof in a court of law, you might get there. You know, if this was presented to a jury and we ran down the information, a jury might come back and say, yeah, that's got to be the date. And that's how historical evidence works. Historical evidence works much more like a courtroom, okay, rather than um, a laboratory. And that's why, frankly, if you're, if you're looking at this online, you'll notice that the title is called Chain of Custody. Do we have chain of custody with the evidence? Okay, so now let's let's take a look at a couple other things here. What I want to do, let me hit up the uh, the screen share here, and we need to look at a document. So let me get there. Do 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 do. Um. Okay, did I put up the one I need? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. 
So this is the one I want to look at first, okay? Now, this was written by Clement of Alexandria, okay? And this is very interesting. Now, this is from, this is not from first or second Clement. This is from, literally, you can see on the graphic here, it was literally um, a collection of miscellaneous writings, right? And he wrote, and there are those who have determined, he's writing about the believers in Alexandria, and there are those who have determined not only the year of the Lord's birth, birth, but also the day, and they say that it took place in the 28th year of Augustus and in the 25th day of Pashon. Further, others say that he was born on the 24th or 25th of Farmuthi. Okay, now those Pashon and Farmuthi are... Egyptian names of calendar months, Egyptian names of calendar months. And I'm going to leave this up here for a second so that we can, so that you can read along, because I want to point out a couple of details. Now, it's not abundantly clear from the quote alone, but when you read the quote in context, it's very clear that Clement is writing in disapproval. He is not happy that these people have done this, right? He's disapproving and he's very skeptical. In other words, he's not writing this because he believes it. He's writing it because he believes people need to know that he is very skeptical of those who claim to have known the date. So isn't this interesting? Isn't this very, very, very interesting that an early church father, an apostolic father, is very skeptical about people who live in the area that he is an overseer, right? And they're writing about the birth date, and he's going, he's pretty much saying, yeah, you know what? I don't know about this. I'm not so sure that I agree with this, right? But they say it's in the 28th year of Augustus, right, which is... I'll get to that in a second. And they mentioned these Egyptian months. Now, Pashon or Pakan, right? I don't even, I don't even know how it's pronounced. I, I, I'm okay with some Hebrew and some Greek, not so good with Egyptian. But that is essentially the month of May. And then Farmuthi is essentially the month of April. So that starts to get pretty skeptical pretty quick because, well, wait a second. Um, that means a very early hypothesis was that he was born in the spring. How the heck did they get to December, right? Very, very, very interesting that if they, if these early Christians in Alexandria believed he was born in the spring, then how the heck did we get to December? Very, very interesting. And then another thing here is that, you know, it's dated to the 28th year of Augustus, as best we can tell, the 28th year of Augustus here is a reference to the Battle of Actium because the Battle of Actium um, was between Anthony and Cleopatra and Augustus and navies. I mean, it, it occurred much, much closer to Greece, but these this is coming from Alexandria in Egypt where there would have been a, you know, a tradition about that battle and things like that. So as best we can tell, that reference is a reference to the Battle of Actium, which occurred in 31 BC. So if he was born in the 28th year, that means he was born in 3 BC. Now that's interesting because we do think that's accurate. So very interesting here that the references that we have they they seem to be somewhat accurate and then also somewhat not, right? But this is a miscellaneous writing by Clement of Alexandria. He is disapproving and skeptical about believers in the Alexandria area who think they have figured it out. See, so that's that's kind of interesting right there. That's kind of interesting. So let's let's move on. Let's talk about another one here. I want to talk about Ignatius, all right? Now, Ignatius was probably born around 35 AD, and he died in like 107, 108 AD. So he is, again, he is one of the early 
church fathers. You know, he, um, I think he was, I believe was Ignatius. I don't remember off the top of my head whether Ignatius was a disciple of John. Let me see if it's um, in my other notes here. Let me check real quick. Let me look over here and see if we can't settle this very quickly here. Um, because what we, what we do want to talk about here in a moment is I want to talk about um, the Apostle John. We are headed there. So do, 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 do. Trying to find this for you guys. Uh, uh, uh. How about this? No. Okay. All right. Well, let's not worry about that. Let's move on. Let's talk about uh, Ignatius and the quote that Ignatius makes here, because this is insightful. So let me go back to screen share for those of you that are watching on video. And let's call up this quote from Ignatius. Now, Ignatius wrote an epistle to the Ephesians. And this is a portion of it. Now, this is interesting because um, it, it we, we can't really glean much from it with regard to day or date or anything like that. But note what he says. He is talking about the birth of Jesus, and he mentions a star, a star shone forth in heaven brighter than all the stars. Its light was indescribable, and its strangeness caused amazement. All the rest of the constellations, together with the sun and the moon, formed a chorus around the star, yet the star itself uh, far outshone them all, and there was perplexity about the origin of this strange phenomenon, which was so unlike the others. Now, part of the reason I bring this up is because, okay, well, this is a demonstration of just how quickly tremendous error can creep in, because this is not accurate. There's unfortunately no way this was accurate, and we can figure that out pretty easily because this is a common argument when it comes to the star. Because if the star was hyper conspicuous, then how was it that it was only the wise men that knew knew that it was there and and knew what it meant? Okay, because if you've got a spectacular display like this, then it's going to draw. A lot of people, hundreds, thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people are going to gather, and especially if it's floating through the heavens, which is the tradition, and it's floating through the heavens in such a way that you can, quote, unquote, follow it, and it's going to lead you to Bethlehem, then it can't be just the Magi who saw it and followed it. So, um, you know, I don't mean to rag on Ignatius here, but this is clearly incorrect. And based upon the information that we do have, we believe that the reference that the Magi make to his star being seen in the rising is a reference to the heliacal rising of the planet Jupiter in the constellation of Leo in conjunction with Regulus in July of 3 BC. And I do other shows about that. You can look those up um, on my website, on the YouTube channel. Find them there, and you'll find out what it's talking about. But my point here, once again, my point here, once again, is that this is an early writing, okay? And Ignatius makes no mention of birth date, right? And that's very interesting because if this was so conspicuous, you mean nobody wrote it down? Absolutely nobody wrote down when this occurred? Is, is that really what happened? Is that really what happened, that you've got this uber conspicuous star shining in the sky, right? We are told in some records that it outshone, that it was visible in daylight, right? And he even says here, um, all the rest of the constellations together with the sun and the moon formed a chorus around the star, yet the star itself far outshone them all. You mean it outshone the sun? Really? I, I mean, come on. Come on, guys. So this, my point being here is that this is an illustration of just how quickly ridiculous ideas can be included in these early writings of the church fathers. So this goes back to my statement about how, you know, the early church is just not as clean as we would like it to be. And that affects a lot of things. It affects a lot of people's understanding about what happened. So 
Let's move on to another one here. This is a quote from Justin Martyr. So let me grab this one. Let me go back to uh, screen share here and find this one. Mr. Justin Martyr, here we go. So here is a quote from Justin Martyr where he writes, Christ was born 150 years ago under Quirinius. Now that's interesting because that's a reference to uh, Quirinius, the uh, quote unquote governor of Syria, okay, who was in charge of the registration. And that's, see, that's another debate. Okay, who was Quirinius? Was he legitimate? When did he order the... Um, the uh, the registration, stuff like that. I cover that in other episodes as well. But this is a statement from Quirinius where he writes, Christ was born 150 years ago under Quirinius. Okay, well then that means this had to have been written roughly around the middle of the second century. So, you know, late 140s, right around 150 to maybe 152, 155 AD had to have been the time that this was written. And take note of the fact that Justin Martyr is using a round number. Okay, he's not remotely trying to pinpoint when Jesus was born other than the reference to Quirinius. That's it. Jesus Christ was born 150 years ago under Quirinius. That's that's the best we get from Justin Martyr. So once again, the point of all this, the reason I'm sharing all this with you is because these are the earliest Christian writings and they are not specifying anything. They're vague at best and they're not using any specificity. And therefore we have to ask the question, did these guys even know? And I think the legitimate answer has to be no, they didn't. Because go back to the one by Clement, that um, that quote from Clement, where he's talking about how believers in Alexandria believe they have figured out when Jesus was born. Okay, well, that tends to suggest very strongly that early believers didn't know. It was not something that was commonly known, and they were trying to figure it out, and that Clement wrote something very disapproving and very skeptical, going, yeah, well, I don't know whether you figured it out or not. And frankly, I don't know whether it's important or not. I'm pretty darn skeptical of this whole matter, whether you guys figured it out or not, and whether it's important or not, because he's he's not paying that kind of attention to it. I mean, he mentions it, okay, but they're not paying super strong attention. So now, however, I want to get to a quote from a man named Irenaeus, an early church father named Irenaeus. Now, he mentions the birth of Christ as well. Once again, it is quite vague. It's quite vague. So let me pop this up. Here we go again. One more time. Let me get this up there. Irenaeus right there. Okay. And so here's the quote from Irenaeus. Now, Irenaeus wrote, For our Lord was born about the 41st year of the reign of Augustus. Okay. So now here it is. So when there is a reference to the birth of Christ, take note that they're generally speaking, they are mentioning the year. Generally speaking, they are mentioning the year, but they're not, and they're, but only occasionally are they mentioning the month or the date, and usually not, right? And they're usually comparing it to the reign of Augustus, right? Now, the challenge there, however, is what component of the reign of Augustus are they citing? Because we one of the earlier quotes said, they, it was the 41st year of Augustus, okay? Well, there are three primary dates that you can work with. One is that after Julius Caesar was assassinated and Octavian, who became Augustus, changed his name, was named Julius Caesar's exclusive heir. So that means, in a manner of speaking, Augustus slash Octavian began reigning in 44 BC. Another possible date 
is the Battle of Actium. That's 31 BC. And then another possible date is the date that he was declared Augustus by the Roman Senate, which would have been 27 BC. So when, when people say from the reign of Augustus, it's got to be pretty much one of these three dates that they're ma making reference to. But if you go back to the 41-year reference, that's pretty much got to be a reference to Julius Caesar declaring Augustus, declaring Octavian to be his heir. OK, because if you go 41 years after 44 B.C., that lands you in 3 B.C. That's a reasonable conclusion. But if you work off of the Actium date, 31 B.C., well, then that lands you in 13 A.D. Uh, that, that can't be right. And then if you go off of the 27 B.C. date and you add 41 years, OK, well, then that puts you even further at like 15, 16, 17 um, AD, and that can't possibly write. So the earlier reference to the 41st year, and well, frankly, and this one here as well, both of them, the references that mention 40 years, that's got to be going off of the ref the reference has to be to Julius Caesar's assassination, and that therefore it's 41 years later right around 343 2 BC. And for the moment, I don't care how hyper accurate they are. They're in the ballpark because that's the one thing I do want to point out is that the these other references, right? When you look at the reference by um, Clement and he mentions that it is the 28th year of Augustus. Okay, well, if the, if the reference there is Actium, then that's about 3 BC. So this is subject to debate. It's not hard and fast, right? Because you might be saying, oh, come on, Tim, that doesn't prove anything. You're right. It doesn't prove anything. It's all very general at this point, all very, very general. The um, evidence that I use that I believe demonstrates he was born in 3 BC it's not this. This is just kind of general info that they're getting you in the ballpark. But then the reason I bring up this quote by Irenaeus is because who taught Irenaeus? Because now we're getting to this idea that I think a lot of people believe is true, but that frankly, my point today is to demonstrate to you that it's not true. It, it, it is true in a way, but it's not true in the way we want it to be. So bear with me one second while we go back to screen share here. Here we go. Back over here. Back over here. And let's go to this. There we go. So here up on the screen, we have a list of five names. And what's very interesting about these five names is that You've got Jesus of Nazareth, then you have John the Apostle, then you've got the early church father Polycarp, the early church father Irenaeus, and then the early church father Hippolytus or Hippolytus, okay? That's just a list because Jesus, you know, Jesus and John were contemporaries, although John was a very young man. Then came Polycarp, then came Irenaeus, then came Hippolytus, one followed the other. One followed the others. Now, let me change this out real quick. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Here we go. Because what you've got is Jesus of Nazareth. We have no doubt that he taught John. That's, that's not debatable, right? Polycarp, however, was a disciple of John. And then it is reported that Irenaeus heard the teachings of Polycarp and then that Hippolytus heard the teachings of Irenaeus. Okay, now I'm not going to go so far as to say that Irenaeus was a disciple of John or to say that Hippolytus was a disciple of Irenaeus because the evidence there is, is weak 
when it comes to establishing just how well did these men know each other or even have contact with each other. So I'm not going to go so far as to say that Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp or that Hippolytus was a disciple of Irenaeus because we don't know that. We don't know if the men ever met. We don't, you know, because if Irenaeus heard the teachings of Polycarp, do you mean he heard Polycarp directly? Like the person, the man, right? And likewise with Hippolytus, did he hear Irenaeus? Did was he in the audience, so to speak, when you know Irenaeus was preaching one time? Or did they simply read the letters and writings, or did they hear someone else who heard them, right? But my point of all this, the reason I bring this all up is because this does have an appearance of a chain of custody. And in many ways, it is a chain of custody because we can establish, we can establish that Jesus taught John, that John taught Polycarp, that Polycarp taught Irenaeus, and that Irenaeus taught, taught Hippolytus. It, we can establish that much, but what we really can't establish is, okay, how detailed was it, right? And therefore, our purpose is here. The reason I bring it up in God Save the King is because I think the assumption of a lot of people who want to protect a December 25th birth date for Jesus think that a chain of evidence or a chain of custody exists with regard to the birth date. In other words, what they want to believe is that Jesus told John his birth date and then that John told Polycarp Jesus's birth date, and that Polycarp told Irenaeus Jesus's birth date, and that then Irenaeus told Hippolytus Jesus's birth date. But that did not happen. It simply did not happen. Like I said, we see from that reference to Ignatius that Ignatius is very disapproving and very skeptical about believers in his area that claim they have figured it out. Well, if they're claiming they have figured it out, Okay, that there you go. That tells us a lot right there that it sure looks as if it was not known and that it really wasn't. I mean, maybe it was a subject of curiosity. Let me put it that way. I think it's highly probable that it was a subject of curiosity, but it really doesn't appear to be a subject of importance. It does appear that the early church fathers were of a mind that it was like, well, you know, wait a second. We have a lot more important things to focus on than when Jesus was born. Let's focus on those. And then, you know, maybe we'll focus on when he was born some other time. So, you know, and us in our modern age with computers and then, because they didn't remember, they didn't have the complete canon of scripture either, right? Did they have, you know, full copies? Well, I, I maybe shouldn't say it that way. But my point being is that we don't know exactly which writings these men had access to. Did they have access to a complete Bible? And therefore, would they have been able to put together what we can put together now, right? Because they just, you know, they're because the the inf, the the exchange of information just would have been nothing like it is now. It would have been very difficult for them to put together the information that we can put together to understand when Jesus could have been born, and frankly, when I believe he was born, which was September 11th of 3 BC, which corresponds to Rosh Hashanah um, on the Jewish calendar, and that this is corroborated by Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 1, and it's corroborated by an unprecedented series of astronomical signs uh, involving the king planet Jupiter and the king star Regulus in the royal constellation of Leo over a 15-month period of time from July of 3 BC until October of 2 BC. You know, that there was an, un, there, and there was, all you got to do is check out a computer program to discover that, that there absolutely was an unprecedented series 
of astronomical signs involving Jupiter, Regulus, and Leo, and then involving things like eclipses and uh, helical risings, heliacal settings, all this kind of stuff that the ancients considered to be these very significant omens. All this stuff occurred in that 15-month period of time. And then the, the timeline, in my opinion, works out really quite precisely because when that series of signs would have stopped in October of 2 BC, that would have been when the Magi would have said, okay, we have seen this extraordinary series of astronomical events. It speaks very loudly about the birth of a great king, in Judea. It speaks very loudly about the birth of a great king in Judea. Oh yeah, by the way, our king has just recently died. Phraates IV of Parthia was recently deceased. So now the Magi, probably not as a whole, but more likely a subset of the Magi, the House of Magistanes, and then involving the House of Surin from the Parthian lower house of parliament, made up their mind, wow, we need to go in search of this king. So if they would have left Parthia, left Stesiphon in late October or early November, got their entourage together, got their army together, and then took the six-week trek that it would take them to get to Judea from the center of Mesopotamia, that means they land in Judea, they, they arrive in Judea, they arrive at the court of Herod the Great in mid to late December of 2 BC, and that actually makes tremendous sense that they would have arrived then. It's even possible, it's even possible that they arrived at the court of Herod the Great on December 24th or 25th. That's entirely possible. And that makes tremendous sense because Matthew chapter two, verse three says that not only was Herod, but all Jerusalem was greatly troubled at the arrival of the Magi. And my hypothesis for quite some time is that their entourage was in the thousands. Right on the low end, I think you're looking at five to seven thousand cavalry escorting this ambassadorial entourage of kingmakers as they arrive in Judea. And on the high end, I think you're potentially looking at 10 to 15 to maybe even 20,000 cavalry that arrived. So, no wonder the inhabitants of Jerusalem freaked out when the Magi arrived. <clears throat> Pardon me. But they arrived in mid to late December of 2 BC. And then we are told that astronomically, this is in Matthew chapter 2, that the star that they saw in the rising went before them and stood directly over where the young child was. And that means, and these guys meticulously tracked the planet Jupiter. And this happens to correspond very precisely with this, what is known as the stations of Jupiter and using an, astro an astronomy program, we can demonstrate that the, station, the first station of Jupiter would have occurred on December 28th, 27, 28, 29 of 2 BC, that Jupiter would have stood directly over Bethlehem as the Magi traveled south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, Jupiter would have been directly overhead and therefore directly over Bethlehem. So it would have gone before them and stood over where the young child was. So this fits the textual evidence without this crazy explanation that we saw by um, Ignatius, was it? Let me go back there. Yeah, Ignatius. So this ridiculous description by Ignatius that it was an indescribable star that was brighter than all the stars in the heavens. Because, sorry, that would have drawn a crowd. And evidently no crowd was drawn. It was only the Magi who figured this out, okay, being professional astronomers. So we only got a couple of minutes here. I want to wrap up with one final thing, which is that when we get to when we get to, when we finally get to Hippolytus and we get to Hippolytus's statement that he believes 
that it was eight days before the calends of January. In other words, eight days before the 1st of January, right? And he's evidently counting inclusively going, uh, here, we, here we go, January 1, December 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25. He's got to count inclusively to get eight days earlier. He evidently, you know, he's the first one. This is in roughly 210 AD is when somebody finally puts a date on it. Well, that's 200 years after Jesus walked the earth, and there's not much evidence um, in that intervening time that anybody really knew. Okay, so we have to, the reasonable conclusion is that no one knew the birth date and that some people were trying to figure it out and that Hippolytus also was trying to figure it out. And when you read the writings of Hippolytus, what you discover is that that is exactly what he was trying to do. He was trying to figure it out because nobody knew. Nobody was able to tell him. No one knew when Jesus was born. So Hippolytus was trying to figure it out. And the conclusion that he arrived at was December 25th. And, you know, like I said, we don't really believe that, but there you have it. So ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it. I got to wrap it up very quickly because I'm running out of time. I am Tim Kyes. Thank you for joining me on God Save the King.